My name is Liam Mather. I'm part of the Public Affairs and Communications team at WPIC Marketing and Technologies. WPIC is a leading technology and e-commerce consultancy that drives revenue for global brands in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. WPIC has an expansive solution set covering data analytics, merchandising, e-commerce activations and store management, warehousing, third-party logistics integrations, digital marketing, creative campaigns, and so much more. And today, we're very honored to be joined by WPIC's co-founder and CEO, Jacob Cook. Jacob has been at the forefront of Asia's e-commerce and consumer revolution. Under his leadership, WPIC has deployed more than 550 brands in various APAC markets, and he has, he has overseen the expansion of the company from humble beginnings in Beijing to a truly global company with hundreds of employees and offices spanning Nanjing, Hangzhou, Osaka, Tokyo, and Vancouver. Today, we're going to learn about Jacob's personal story as an entrepreneur in China and Japan and some of the lessons he's learned along the way uh, scaling up his business and also some of his interesting personal stories and experiences from living in the region for nearly two decades. So welcome, Jacob. Thank you for joining us. So where are you from and why did you come to J Japan first and then to China? Well, um, I was born uh, in Canada. Uh, 1978 uh, and grew up through the Canadian education system. I spent uh, the first few years of my professional life in the US so my original education was in uh, electronic engineering mainly uh, in telecommunications hardware. Um, so I lived through the whole 3G revolution um, and installation and, and really the hardware backbone of going wireless inside the United States and then really from there you know most of the things turned into a software upgrade so I actually had to go back to school after only a very short career in engineering uh, and get back into software engineering. Um, and I originally started to do that in Japan, um, but I actually very quickly switched, I think, after those first nine months to transfer uh, into China um, and then finished uh, another degree in computer science uh, at Jiaotong University uh, and then went on to uh, start this organization um, shortly after that, almost uh, about 17 years ago now. Um, that journey looked very different in those first early days. It was less of a consultancy and more about building up some of our own products. Okay. We had um, a small group of us, but we built uh, what was an original Airbnb for the 2008 Olympics. So I think we rented out about 1,400 rooms uh, in people's homes. That was a company that quickly went viral. Uh, exited out of that uh, in 2009 and really went full time at that point into WPIC. Okay, fantastic. So. Can you tell us a bit more about WPIC in its current form? What are the services and solutions that you're providing to clients? Yeah, we look at ourselves basically as being in four major divisions. I think the largest where you know, roughly 60% of our revenue comes in is uh, what we call a, a TP or a trade partner. And that's really sort of your e-commerce service providers. And that's fairly extensive. We're more sort of uh, as a one stop compared to the others that operate in this field because we do operate logistics, we do capital repatriation, we have a very strong merchandising team, um, as well as everything that goes on into the day-to-day -day operations of e-commerce. Um, the other three divisions uh, that you know constitute the other 40% of our revenue, two of them are software. Um, one of them sort of being our competitive advantage is Descripto. Descripto is our distributed script engine. It's really our big data platform that is capable of gathering incredibly large amounts of information about your, um, your, your particular product category. Uh, the software itself is 5,500 different servers that work in tandem to gather everything from social media, comments, um, you know, sales revenue from your competitors, purchasing profiles, um, really you name it. Um, it's used by a lot of the Fortune 100, including Nike, AstraZeneca, uh, Lululemon, um, to sort of make business decisions on the information that's available uh, in market. Uh, Chinalytics is another software division. That one is basically uh, it focuses on e-commerce attribution. So one of the things is, is you know, how much you know, is your social media efforts contributing? How much is your content, your PR? And how does that all mix in contributing to your overall revenue? So it's, it's really good at analyzing your own data for attribution. One of the big problems in China is, is being able to do that effectively um, because so much of it is controlled by the platform. So, you know, you know very specifically, you know, I've got a 33% contribution from my WeChat or, or Weibo campaigns, for example. And then CDL is just a custom tech solution division. We build a lot of custom software for companies, including likes of IKEA and building out their mobile experience in China. Um, 
you know, so that's basically how we look at the group as a whole. And all four of those, there's a lot of synergies between them um, in terms of being able to optimize and uh, giving real advantage to our, our clients. Fantastic. Before we dive in to a little more detail about each of these services, I want to take, take a step back and ask you to maybe explain to the audience some of the unique features of China's digital landscape. I think a lot of Westerners are maybe not familiar with the, the apps that people use. Um, what the digital landscape looks like, if you could just elaborate on that. Yeah, well, most of, if not up to 90% of the actual purchases happen on third-party apps like Tmall, like Jingdong, like Pinduoduo, and the Chinese version of TikTok, um, which is very different. I mean, if you look at, you know, Apple or these other companies like that, everything happens on Apple.com. They very rarely venture into platforms. In fact, they're, for a long time, the only platform that they operated outside of their own .com was Tmall. Um, and it took them many years to make that that decision. And it's it's like that with a lot of other brands too as well, is that you're not able to be very successful here with your dot-coms or your siloed um, websites unless you have a massive brand pull and only a handful of companies can actually pull that off. Um, so you are, you are into the third-party apps. So that there's different social medias here, there's different uh, e-commerce apps and they're, they're ginormous with, with huge user bases. So what a lot of brands are doing is setting up these flagship stores on Tmall and Jingdong, the main e-commerce platforms. Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and that's, like I said, that's probably 60% of our business. What we try to also do is to make that as easy as possible, whereby we connect as many of the back end through technology so we can have single source inventory, single source customer service, video content can be shared across multiple different platforms to really sort of minimize the workload that goes into having multiple different platforms, mm. you know, and the more exposure that you have, of course, it's going to affect your top line revenue. Brilliant, brilliant. And can you maybe talk a little bit about kind of what the how, uh, Chinese consumer trends? How do Chinese people shop? Where do they go to shop? Uh, maybe what are some of their preferences compared to other markets? Because I believe one of WPIC's value propositions is helping Western brands you know, really understand and sell to the Chinese consumer. Yeah, I think we certainly do have a big value proposition there because we're able to connect the culture. It is quite different. You're right. I mean, um, you don't have as much control being on a third party app of that overall experience as you do with your own sort of dot com website and shop experience. So for us, it's about, you know, localizing the product offering, understand how it's going to resonate with consumers here. Um, everything from understanding different sizes and body types for apparel, different color uh, uh, patterns and things like that, that that are just different preferences to, you know, how are home appliances used? You know, for example, cooking very different types of food. There's differences in the kitchen, you know, um, and all this, these sort of things that go along with that. So the consumer, I mean, it, the, the growth rate over the last 20 years has been incredible. That's really the story of China. You're now, you know, still uh, absolutely booming. I know there's a lot of news um, out there potentially about China slowing down, but you're really talking about slowing down from an 8% GDP to, you know, 5.6. I mean, I think people can imagine what 4% growth looks like, who in the last 20 years, we've maybe experienced that once or twice, um, which is just absolutely insane. Now, when you take, it's not a small starting point in this economy either, but yeah, when you're still 20 years now of plus five digit growth, I mean, it, it, it's just, you know, it, 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 it's hard to even, you know, describe that of, of how massive that is and how big the opportunities here are inside the consumer space. Fascinating. And can you talk about the recent growth of e-commerce specifically? Because one of WPIC's main thing is helping people sell on e-commerce platforms. Yeah. So, you know, e-commerce... Um, has been big for a long time, of course, but you know we were looking at um, sort of very consistent growth. You know, if you're looking at overall revenue, like 30% growth um, year over year. Uh, but you know, since the pandemic, it really ended up being more like 100% growth. Um, you know, it really put more of a huge dent inside retail outlets that were already headed down. But you know, it expanded the base. Older people started buying online. They started buying more things online. So home appliances started to boom. Stuff that was really having a hard time making the jump from retail uh, into, into home. Your food, your groceries. Now, the adoption rates of all of these different types of e-commerce is, is almost to the point of saturation, which is great. And now we're really riding off of higher salaries, higher disposable income, higher net worth inside the families. Um, so all of that's been been fantastic. Very interesting, very interesting. 
Um, why don't we move to sort of WPIC's own growth story? So um, maybe you can, can, can kind of chart for us how the company has expanded over the last maybe 10 years. Yeah, I think a 10 years is a pretty good time frame. It's, you know, if you, and you could probably divide it up into two five year periods. We really sort of were in before the e-commerce boom in China. So how we originally started was just a small digital marketing agency that focused maybe more on the B2B side of things than the B2C, which was where a lot of the early giants that sort of came into the market were the Danahers, the Honeywells, et cetera, mm -hmm. and supporting these and their lead generation efforts um, was a primary part of the business. I would say sort of 2013, 2014, the business changed at that point, whereby we started to really ride the e-commerce curtails. 2014 is when we launched our two software projects, uh, both with Chinalytics and Descripto. And from that point on, um, e-commerce really boomed for us, like from 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, but again, with the pandemic, uh, for us, we've kind of been riding the last two years triple digit growth. That have, has brings its own you know, unique challenges. Mm -hmm. um, just even adding the personnel to grow, you know, we're, we added 100 people in the last uh, 12 months. That's an incredible lot of resumes, you know, that that's probably over a thousand interviews that we've been conducting in that time um, to be able to make sure that we get the top level talent that, that you know, is required for operation. Um, we've opened up new branches. We've actually expanded every single office in the last 12 months globally. Uh, so Osaka now has a new penthouse top floor. Um, you know, we've expanded Beijing quite a bit. We have a new facility in Hangzhou. Uh, we've got now 200 people in our Nanjing facility. We've just opened our second, where third warehouse, cor sorry, correction, um, in China as well. We're probably looking to add a fourth. So I think we're sitting now at about 140,000 square feet uh, in total um, warehouse capacity. You know, we're doing, I think, like 14,000, 15,000 packages per day out of our own facilities. And that's only domestically. That doesn't include our cross-border business. So um, it's, it's been wild. You know, we're having a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, you, you always like it when, in those big growth areas. Um, but we're probably expecting that, you know, to continue into next year. Um, and then maybe sort of get back to something normal, um, you know, 2023. Wow. And so what's the headcount looking like now across all these offices? Approaching 400 now. Um, so it's been, a lot of that's been added in the last couple of years. You know, uh, we still have our first employee though. We have a very excellent retention rate. Um, and these are some of the things I think that have really helped us to be able to grow, uh, keep that, those customer relationships, um, you know, and I think people stick around. Um, they like working here and that's been important to us, you know. Um, we take our HR departments and our finance departments very seriously. It's one of the most important areas, I think, of the company. Um, you know, we recruited out of the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain specifically to provide the Ritz-Carlton experience was the exact mandate I gave them to our employees and our staff inside China that Ritz-Carlton was providing to their guests. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and I think, you know, when certainly compared to other companies, our retention rate's incredible. Um, we lose very, very few people. And, and, you know, especially Chinese New Year, you know, that's a big time where people get their bonuses and then hand in their papers. I think it's been three years in a row where our turnover at Chinese New Year has been zero. Um, and I also don't think we've lost anybody uh, except one person in the last six months who moved to another country to be with their wife. And that was it. Wow. So, And one thing that's been in the news a lot recently is the work culture at Chinese tech companies. Yeah. So you've elaborated on this already, but what are some of the differences with how you run WPIC in China compared to these other Yeah, well, to be companies? frank about this, what happens is a lot of CEOs just steal from their employees. And we hear a lot about 996 culture, right? Where it's actually not compensated over time. That's just theft. That's just, that's just CEOs being lazy, not hiring the right people, not investing in HR, not um, being able to sell their products for the proper amount of money and effectively just stealing that money from their employees. I mean, 996 is theft. It is straight up theft from employees. Um, we, it's now illegal, thankfully, but uh, we have completely avoided that. If you cannot do your job in a nine to five or nine to six manner, there's probably a problem with the position or the job requirements or what we've done in order to do that. I mean, our people are great. We do deal with a lot of different time zones. So we do have that constraint but we do not do 996. Family is always gonna be the most important priority in everybody's life and we fully understand that. Just for the audience, 996 refers to the work culture of working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, which has been a common feature at uh, Chinese technology companies over the last couple of years. 
That's fantastic. Okay, so you talked about WPIC story up until today. What about the next five years? What are some of the new maybe growth uh, opportunities for WPIC? Well, we still see growth uh, across the APAC region now um, with really sort of China leading the way in terms of how e-commerce technology is going to be rolled out inside other markets. Um, so it's great that we now have the skill sets um, of that. You know, we are uh, training now and, and rolling out live streaming in Japan. We're going to be one of the first companies inside the Japanese market to do it. And of course, we're bringing the expertise of all the training that we've done here. Um, so our Japanese CEO is actually in market with us going through all this stuff, getting ready to set this up. So the day that it opens up, I mean, we're going to have a full suite uh, in, inside Japan, really leading the way there as well. Um, we're now operating in Southeast Asia. You know, we're a little bit late getting our Singapore office open due to the pandemic, but we're going to be opening up down there um, and expanding our offering uh, even further. So the backend logistics, a lot of the groundwork has already been completed for that. So we can still do single source inventory through various bonded and non-bonded warehouses so that, you know, we can open up not just maybe five platforms in China, but start to add Korea, start to add Japan, start to add Shopee, Lazada, all these other ones that are, you're, you know, also in triple digit growth in a lot of cases in some of these markets. But again, not expanding the workload that we're putting on the client in terms of you know back-end infrastructure so as we're shooting video content as we're doing commercials we're going to be doing it going forward as it not just being for you know northeast asia but for all of asia um, and i think that you know it's going to be a very unique offering for wpic that we're going to be able to support in so many different markets fantastic i'd, I'd like to ask you quickly about live streaming i think it's a phenomenon that has not caught on in the west can you maybe explain what live streaming is, why it's so popular in China, and how it's part of the e-commerce shopping experience? Well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, I compare it, quite frankly, a lot to uh, like QVC and online shopping, I mean, or, uh, or television shopping, right? So it's not so much that it, you know, not caught on, but certainly that influence is really coming from there, you know? Um, and it, 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 it almost seems like it was coming full circle. It's maybe just the medium that has changed. So what it is basically is online television shows in more of a shorter video where people are talking about the product and they're interacting. So we have message boards and people can send messages to the host and ask questions in real time. And they can explain that feature. They can talk about that feature and really interact with the audience. So, you know, and, and uh, it, it, it's really booming, you know. And so you've got a, a couple of different ways. You have one is you've got huge influencers and KOLs that will take your products for a fee and put them on their channels. Um, we use a lot of those. And then we have, uh, I think, 13 or 14 studios now at our various offices. We're also streaming, you know, you know, 15, 16 hours a day um, in a lot of cases for our own products and our own internal use uh, to our own audiences. So it, it, it works quite well. I think video format... Um, really allows us to, to communicate. It's, it's really sort of a two-way medium between the consumers and yourself as a brand. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, because uh, a lot of the businesses focus on China, and WPIC is a Canadian company, have the tensions between the West and China in the last few years, and especially with the US and China, since a lot of clients are American brands, has that impacted the business? And if not, how have you navigated that? I think a lot of it is overblown. I mean, certainly the tariffs have gone up, but you know, we those probably sound a lot worse because what people probably don't understand is that there, it's a high tax environment. Um, you know, so there's a lot of VAT tax, there's import taxes already. So putting a 25% tariff, um, you know, maybe would only affect the retail price by like six to eight percent. In a lot of cases, the American products didn't have. Um, uh, price advantage anyway. So it, it wasn't fatal. In fact, if you look at overall trade between the countries, it never went down. And if I were to tell you, if I were to strip the dates out of the graph in terms of bilateral trade, you could not tell me from the graph of when those tariffs went in or not. Um, so it's not having a huge effect. And it's, and it's both ways. It's also you know trade that, that's going from uh, China to the United States. More exemptions are being granted as well. So you know, very few products are entirely 100% made in the United States. So even the products that are made there will contain Chinese components. In those cases, we're able to get exemptions from the tariffs. We've got a very good team that deals with this. I think, I heard a statistic, something like 30% of the exemptions that have been granted have been granted through us um, in terms of products coming in from the US. So um, that's what one, uh, one customs department had told us. So um, we know what we're doing. And I think it's just the matter of, of being able to make those cases properly and um, finding out understanding the components uh, and then if you can find a way to get an exemption get get the exemption very interesting uh, can you maybe walk through for a client 
working with us to set up their e-commerce store in China. What does that process look like? How are we sort of shepherding that client and that brand into the market? How are, how are, the, how are their products eventually getting in the hands of a Chinese consumer? Well, I think in terms of our e-commerce business, there's really, it falls into two categories, right? You've got brands that are here already. Maybe they've misstepped. Um, and they need a partner with the expertise and the capabilities that we have, that's a little bit different. That's a pretty much cut and cut and cut and go because you know they've got the inventory and market, they've generally done the paperwork, they just need operational effectiveness. For somebody that's looking to enter the market, I mean there's a process that we go through. We're gonna to want to run Descripto, we're gonna to want to go through and look at the market. You know, maybe there's a $2 billion market for what you're doing, but maybe your price points are not competitive. Maybe there's actually not going to be a fit. So we want to make sure that before we go down any of those paths that we really looked at the market and we've got a very good play. And for a lot of companies, they have a very broad skew set. We usually will break that down saying, okay, you have the best opportunity with these 40, 50, 60, maybe 200 SKUs. Um, you know, brands in China, Clothing brands might just be outerwear brands in China. They might be very different based on what their offering is. So we get that all out of the way before we even start. Then from there, we're gonna to wanna to basically work with a couple of different teams. Legal, logistics, um, we'll be working on you know, product assortment with our merchandising teams. We'll be working with the marketing and creative to localize content. And then uh, data and, and, and um, uh, uh, reconciliation, as well as being able to connect the ERP. So people work on whether it's Hybris or SAP or whatever, we have to get the data about the business that's going back. So we kind of work all three of those in tandem. We're pretty good at getting that process down to about two to three months. Um, so really once that stuff hits the boat, you know, you got about two months to be up and ready and then big splash on, on grand opening. Um, and then just running through analytics, continuously optimizing, looking at all your core metrics like conversion rates, traffic, organic traffic, time on site, and just making sure that every single day that our operations team is making those numbers get a little bit better each and every day so that your margins are getting better and your business is continuing to grow um, with the market in China. Fascinating, fascinating. And for many of our clients, especially smaller brands, they don't need to put people on the ground in China. They can partner with us and we'll manage their entire retail operation. I think here. for a lot of them, they don't, most of them don't have pe people on the ground here and have no probably plans to do it. In fact, a lot of our brands have been unwinding their offices here. Um, they're hard to manage, they're hard to staff, turnover actually in China is quite high. And in a lot of cases, it's easier to outsource those services. You know, when you having a small team of five or six people, they can get dated in their skill set. This market changes so often that it's better to be partnered up with an agency like ours that is continuously rolling through skill sets, adding, you know, when Douyin and TikTok come onto the scene, you know that we're going to have a department with expertise there. That's much harder to do when you're running a small remote office that you're expecting them to continuously build up their skills. So we're unwinding a lot of those offices that are not needed um, anymore. Uh, but you know, there's also larger companies like Nike, for example, where we can come in and fill in intelligence and you know, um, help to build up skill sets and analytics for them uh, that, that really sort of you know, fill in the blanks that they're missing. I mean, they've got thousands of people in China. Fascinating. Oh, uh, I want to pivot a little bit. Can you, can you talk about your own experience as an entrepreneur in China? What were some of the challenges you faced? Maybe what, what makes being an entrepreneur in China unique from being an entrepreneur in the West? Well, I've always been an entrepreneur in Asia. Um, you know, I started my career essentially here, um, other than, um, you know, getting here sort of in my mid-20s, uh, going to school here and going through that whole path. Um, um, it's a lot different, you know, it, it really is. I mean, um, I remember, you know, I, I remember my first office that I rented, you know, just to give you an idea, um, you know, trying to make that relationship, renovated it, did everything. And I called the landlord and I said, hey, come, come see what I did with the place. Well, wow, boy, was she impressed. So impressed she kicked me out the next day and doubled the rent to somebody else. So I had to learn, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore. And, um, you know, building relationships is, is, is key um, and understanding who you're doing business with. Um, you know, and I also think there's, there's two parts, you know, I think that not only in the business do we want to offer a great product, but I want to be a good customer with all the vendors that we have too as well. In fact, I want to be your best customer. It's been a policy of mine. Um, pay early, pay on time, and just, you know, make sure that both, you know, sides of every transaction you're operating as effectively, as ethically as possible. Um, and I think that goes a long way. You know, reputation is, is everything. You only got that one reputation. Um, and I think we've done a reasonably good job of that. But at the same time, there's a lot of CYA as well. You know, you need to, you know, do your homework, understand, you know, um, how things work here. 
Uh, it can, in some cases, be the Wild West, but the environment's also changed a lot. You know, we have a lot of law firms. We probably, for a company our size, overspend on big four accounting on, you know, we have the same lawyers as Apple does, for example. I think a lot of that is very important. Um, compliance is extremely important, much more so, um, I think, so than Western countries. I think we've been way ahead of that. So, you know, a lot of times they'll announce new laws, wait a couple of years before they start enforcing it. We're, we know when those laws are getting dealt and we're, we're compliant right away, much better than I think our, our, our competitors. So we don't give anybody, you know, any reason or anything like that. Um, I think just going through those things are probably what make it a lot different. Um, but in general, I really like the people I work with. I think I, we have a lot of fun. We work hard. We're smart. Um, and coming to work you know, with, with that type of a talent pool beside you on a daily basis makes things very enjoyable. And you just touched on this, but how has the business environment in China changed since you started WPIC? Well, I think that uh, intellectual property protections, trademark protections, all of that has really strengthened a lot. It's really kind of allowed us to make more investments in those areas, you know, certain on taking on rights and protecting rights. And brands also feel now more comfortable coming into market that they're better protected too as well. So, you know, all of those things together have really sort of make people feel comfortable in increasing their investments. I want to ask you maybe some more fun questions. So you're constantly traveling around China between the Beijing office, the Hangzhou office, the Nanjing office and warehouse space. Um, you know, what, what, what do you kind of like to do for fun and, and, and unwind after you're busy day of, of work and travel? Well, I like to play sports and I like to exercise a lot. I think that's important in sort of keeping, you know, your mind and body healthy. Um, I've got two kids that so keep me busy as well, you know. Um, you know, having young children is obviously a lot and they've got a lot of stuff going on. But try to unwind on the weekend, spending as much time with family as possible because, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I am on the road quite a bit during the week. Um, I play hockey which is, uh, you know, uh, China and especially Beijing, where I live, has an excellent uh, uh, adults ice hockey league, one of the best I've actually seen anywhere in the world. So uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. I look forward to that every week as well. Fantastic, fantastic. What's maybe your favorite thing about living in China? You've stayed here for, you know, a good chunk of your adult life. So what yeah, I think, keeps you going? Yeah, I think respect? the food is incredible. I mean, that's a, that's a great part. I mean, having all these excellent restaurants everywhere, too, is just fantastic. I think also uh, the infrastructure, you know, in terms of being able to travel between, you know, these different cities, um, it's far better than what I experienced, you know, traveling around the U.S. It's uh, huge airplanes, big, comfortable. The high speed rail network is amazing. The highways are awesome. This stuff is all brand new. Um, you know, there's there's A380s that fly domestically inside China, you know, to give you an idea of just the level of difference in infrastructure. Um, you know, if you go to, into the States, it's going to be tiny single aisle aircraft where you're jammed in for two to three hour flights. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, even economy in China is better than business in the U.S., I find. So uh, that makes everything a lot easier and efficient, you know, flights to most of these cities every 15 minutes. So it does make it, you know, being able to operate in multiple cities. And for us, that's important because we need multiple talent pools. So it's not like we can just have one major office in Beijing. Mm. We wouldn't be able to hire fast enough there. So operating in the three cities like we do allows us to, you know, have really good access to a talent pool. I think about 50 million people when you look at the populations from those three cities. So that really helps, you know, our, our, to, to achieve our growth targets. And what's maybe your favorite place to travel in China for you know, fun? Oh, man, you know, um, I think they're all kind of interesting, you know. Um, I think I like Shanghai quite a bit, though. I think it's just a very sophisticated city, um, very international. Um, you know, it's, uh, we don't have an office there, um, but uh, for I, I, I think it's probably one of the cities that I enjoy the most inside China. But I think, you know, they've all got their very uniqueness or different aspects of the things that you like to do there. And... Uh you run WPIC alongside your brother, who uh, is sort of a, a co-partner. Co-part- Can you talk about your relationship, how, how you divide the workload? And Yeah, so, I mean, we basically, uh, uh, you know, if you were to look at it, it would be revenue and profit, right? So I run the operations. Uh, my brother deals a lot with uh, new business, new clients, expanding the business. Our financial headquarters is in Vancouver, where he operates. Most of our business development is done out of North America. Um, we spend about two hours on the phone every day, you know, usually one in the morning and one at night where we're handing over, um, the issues and work from each individual office into the next one. So we kind of have a 24 hour operation going. Um, I think that's 
been pretty pretty helpful and, and I think it's great. I mean, anytime you can work with family members and you've got a great relationship like that. We also have very different skill sets. You know, so my brother's much more on the business side of things. I'm much more on the technology and engineering side of things. So it's very complimentary um, set as well. Fantastic. Um, and can you talk a little bit about language learning since you've been here, um, you know, learning Chinese, learning Japanese, what's that process been like? How has that been helpful in your career? Yeah, I think um, it helps. Um, for sure. I mean, understanding a lot of the culture comes through language too as well. Um, it's never been something I've been very good at. You know, I think I was always, you know, straight A student in math and desperately trying to pass my French classes in Canada. But I really like it too, um, despite not being very good at it. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time, did go to university in Chinese. Um, so I think much, I have a much stronger language set in Chinese than I do Japanese, for example. Um, but it's a lot of repetition, a lot of memorizing, you know, getting great teachers. Uh, but in general, it's not as hard as I think a lot of people think it's going to be. Um, our working language is English um, at this company, but we, uh, you know, we do speak a lot of Chinese, of course. And, you, you know, in order to get by and survive, you're, you're going to need to strong language skills as possible. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you, Jacob, for your time. Uh, and hope everyone enjoyed uh, the discussion today. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. Thanks.